Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and today I want to talk to you about some of those pieces of advice that travel along with roses, those uh, practices like uh, soaking them before you plant them or feeding them with Epsom salts. I'm going to put a list of them up on the screen here right now so you can have a look at what I'm going to talk about, but I want some help with this. I've uh, enlisted the help of Kimberly from the Rose Geeks YouTube channel. We've talked before on this channel, and I want to get her a take on this because it may be that in different places you have different approaches to growing roses. Some of these might be right, some of them might be wrong, some of them might just be specific to your own garden. So let's talk with Kimberly and see what she has to say about them. All right, well thanks so much for doing this. I'm really glad you could join me today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you again. I can't remember how long it's been uh, since we last spoke. Maybe yeah, probably, probably over a year by now. Well, I'm happy to be chatting with you again. Perfect. So what I wanted to do is I want to go through some rose facts and folklore, some advice that's out there and get your reaction to it a little bit. See okay. what it is that you think you agree with, some that you maybe disagree with, or maybe it's just situational. So the first one that I wanted to bring up here is something I read. It might have even been in your group, which was attributed to Cordes. And they said, you should never mulch your roses. They prefer bare soil. Now, I have to say, when I looked at this afterwards, I check to see if it really was on the Cordes website. And it's not on there now, or at least that I could find. So maybe this is just something that's been misattributed. But basically, they said, don't mulch your roses. What do you think of that? I find that fascinating. And I think that my, my initial response would be, no way. But as I'm reading through their thought process, why they're saying that, okay, um, you know, and Cortez are such healthy roses, and it, I would want to emulate what they're doing. But what I'll share with you now, I'm in for anybody who is not familiar with where I garden, I garden in Maryland, zone 7B. I have very heavy clay soil and very high humidity. And so, with that, I struggle with black spot. And so, I love Cortez roses because they're very hardy here for me. They're not delicate at all. I don't have to spray them. Um, but I made the mistake one year, last year, of not mulching. I thought, you know, let me go ahead and just compost 600 roses and I'll be really good about not using mulch. And I'm telling you, I was miserable the entire year, it was just constant weeds. I could not stay on top of it. And I swore I would never, ever make that mistake again. And so this year I'm on top of mulching. And, uh, you know, I think that when I, when I was reading through the Cordes rationale of, you know, not mulching, you know, directly right next to the crown, I thought, well, okay, maybe that's something that I can implement. But here the problem is, and you know, there are whether or not you're going to have that crown above the ground, below the ground, very hot topic. It gets people really upset. But where I am, if you are keeping that crown above ground, well, now you're going to want to mulch that all the way up to the rose. And so I really think that this, the topic of whether or not you mulch would be a personal decision, but I can only share that you know, from my experience, if I don't mulch, I'm miserable uh, because of the amount of work with weeding. Um, and so that's a personal decision that I've made. And then also where I am with the water, the roses that are on the water, I definitely need to mulch those up really good so that they can make it through my winter. And I'm thinking that the folks that are in zone five, you're going to want to mulch. And that's one of the guidance that we're given all the time is make sure you're mulching the crown, the, the canes, getting it below the ground. But that's my thought. I mean, what were you thinking when you read it? Yeah, I had a hard time with with the logic that was attached to this. And some of the reasons they gave here, they said, first of all, uh, and they, they specifically talked a little bit about wood mulch. Don't use bark mulch or wood mulch around the roses. And they said that the wood would consume nitrogen from the soil or tie up nitrogen from the soil which is kind of a myth. I mean, this is something that's been debunked before. It does tie up some nitrogen, but only in a very surface surface layer for shallow rooted things. But for shrubs and more deeply rooted perennials, it shouldn't make any difference. Uh, they also talked about that it would uh, that it would stop the oxygen from going up and down in your soil. And I, I, yeah. I think that's not, I, I read from Linda Chalker Scott, her reasons, she's a, a doctor out of uh, Washington uh, state who did a great job on mulch. So I, I couldn't find much validity to it. Uh, 
from my point of view, putting mulch on the soil uh, keeps more consistent moisture in the soil. It keeps more consistent temperature in the soil. It adds organic matter as it breaks down. Mm -hmm. And it also prevents weeds or suppresses weeds. So I wouldn't do it without it. I, I didn't find a lot of validity to those those reasons. So maybe we can move on from that one. So okay. the next thing that I wanted to talk about here is uh, a piece of advice. This is number two here, which is you should sh you should soak your bare root roses. And people give different timings on this. It's either one hour, six hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. But definitely they say it's important to soak your bare root roses before planting. What's your practice on that? Well, I absolutely agree that you have to have a period of soaking because uh, for your bare roots, they you have to picture that they've been lifted from the field at the grower. Now they're put into a freezer or a storage area for a period of time before they're packaged and brought to you. And so you do want to rehydrate them for a period of time when they get to your home. So the question is, how long? And when I'm doing unboxings, and I don't know how many I've done I don't know if it's 30 different companies. It's amazing to me the different um, guidance that you're going to get, whether it's a short second of four hours or if it's 24. Um, and then when I'm talking to people in my Facebook group and they're like, ah, you know, I've let it go for a week. I've let it go for two weeks. I've forgotten about them. How can you forget about these roses? But anyways, they keep them in there for an extended period of time. And um, I absolutely in my opinion, they have to be rehydrated. Um, but have I done an experiment? Uh, I have not done an experiment where I have not rehydrated them. That would be something interesting to try. Um, but I, 24 hours is my role for hydration. And it's typically because uh, when I first started gardening on um, early rosarian, that was the guidance that I was given. And so I've used it and never had problems. Um, and usually I'm so busy working on stuff. So as soon as they arrive, I pop them in water by itself. And then I'm working and doing other stuff and getting ready to put them in the ground. Um, I'll only share with you uh, an experiment that I did one time. As I'm reading, you know, people say that they have let them soak for an extended period of time. And then they had to go on a trip or for whatever reason they had, they couldn't get them out of the water. I decided to try it. And so I did an experiment where I soaked them. I, I, I bought them bare root from my local box store and I put 12 of them in buckets and I let them soak for two weeks and they started to wake up and they were fine and pushing new roots in this water. But as soon as they woke up, that's when the problem started. And I think that they became dependent on that water source and being, it's kind of like having your cut roses in water. Um, and so when I kept on trying to take them out and put them in the ground, they really suffered. And then I was trying to play with those times. Okay, well, how do I get them not dependent? How do I wean them off of this water source? And bottom line, Jason, they all croaked. So I do okay. think that there's a fine line on there of how long you want to soak and I don't know uh, what the answer is. I just know for me, it's 24 hours. So how about you? Um, are you soaking your roses? Honestly, no. Um, ah, it's, okay. And it's and it's not a big deal. It's I think a 24 hour soak would be safe. I okay. think it, I think it'd be fine. And and it has been for generations of roses. It's a piece of advice that's been passed down since it seemed okay. at the beginning of time. And I don't I couldn't find a study or a research paper that supported its use. But I think it's just one of those things that's just been done. There is a good horticultural sense to it because you've taken it out from the field, like you mentioned, you stored it in a cooler for, you know, uh, several months and the uh, suppliers are keeping it at a low humidity or a low moisture level because they're trying to not have these things rot while in storage. So once you get it home, if you want to rehydrate it, I think that's a helpful thing. I think that's, but I would base it on as needed. If they come in plump and moist and well hydrated, I've put them directly into pots. I've put them directly into the ground and I haven't seen any problem with it. If they come okay. in looking a little bit dry, a little bit parched, a soak for 24 hours would be fine. I've seen people say, oh, you need to soak it in bleach or B1 vitamin. Uh -huh. I would I would kind of recommend against that. That sounds more like, a, 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 you know, folklore to me, but uh, a short soak of 24 or 48 hours. The, the, what you said about going with a longer soak totally makes sense. 
And it's not about them getting used to having that water necessarily. I think what it is, is uh, every living part of a plant requires oxygen. Right. And when it's underwater, it can get oxygen deprived. If it's underwater for a long period of time and it's still water, uh, it's not getting what it needs for respiration. And then you end up with cell or tissue damage. So short soak, yes, or it's okay. Long soak, uh, probably not. And for, uh, uh, for a plump, you know, turgid rose, I would think it may even be unnecessary. And that's what I do with good results. I'm glad uh, that you said that, Jason. So I might try that. I might try to put some in uh, without soaking them. Um, but that's really encouraging. And I agree with you. I don't put anything in the water, just straight water. And I think I've heard people put B1 in. I think bleach is frightening <laughs> to put bleach in uh, a soak. So that one is interesting. But I, I, my recommendation, if you're going to soak, straight water is fine. They're asleep. Just give them a little drink. Perfect. So number three here is the advice that you should prune your roses on a 45 degree angle, uh, slanting away from the bud. Very oddly specific, but let's let's go with it. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think of that? Can you imagine how long that would take? And that, and and so yes, okay. The, I think that there is guidance that you know is shared, and people don't know why they do it. And when I've read that why people are ha having a forty-five degree angle, they've said, well, the roses are going to rot. You know, they'll get water that sits on them, and so you have to have it at an angle so that the water will run off. And I am pruning so many roses. I do not have time to be inward, outward, you know, I'm just a quick snip, you know, let's get them down to the right height. And I've never had any issues. And I'll share with everybody, I've never had anything rot in my life based on the angle of a cut. And um, I think that I challenge everybody, I want you to just go to your rose with a natural hand, and using your natural grip on these pruners, you might be at a 45 degree angle anyways, and you're not even thinking about it. I just think when you, it, it would be harder for me to make it straight. Um, but uh, I really don't give that a whole lot of thought and I've never had a problem. And I'm also using um, prune sealer, which we'll get into, but what is your thought on angle? Yeah, I mean, horticulturally, there's there's not a lot of basis to this. It's another one that's been passed down since the beginning of time by Rose people. But uh, when you look at the studies, there's nothing that really supports it. And generally, the studies I have found say that the uh, smaller the surface area of the cut, the better the outcomes that you have. And obviously, by going on a slant like that, you end up with a larger surface area. So there's more of a chance of rot. In any case, I just go with what you just said, which is you don't want to make this too complicated. Let's not let's yeah. not turn this into something that's difficult for a new grower to do, a new gardener to do. Yeah. Go with your natural grip, cut at whatever angle you go yeah. with. Straight cut is fine. And uh, it is, uh, as far as I can tell, and your my experience matches yours, that I've never seen a um, a cut rot because it was on the wrong angle. Well, I know that you and I don't agree on pruning sealer. So let's talk about that. Tell me how sure. you feel about pruning sealer. <laughs> um, okay, so pruning sealer is um, on larger cuts, horticulture has debunked that thoroughly. Uh, they went out and they looked and saw that when you cut off a tree limb, if you mm -hmm. paint on yeah. pruning sealer, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't work to do the thing that they want it to do, which is to try to heal that up and stop it from rotting. Outcomes yeah. are worse when you use pruning sealer. Um, now, the reasons why people use it for roses are slightly different. People say, I'm doing it to keep the cane borers from getting into the ends of my roses. And that would assume that you have the, the worst of the cane borers flying around looking for those cut ends of your stems at the time of year that you make your pruning cuts. So I would challenge that assumption on a couple of things. First of all, um, cane borers are not flying around. If your timing is early spring, early or early spring or late fall or late winter, they're not flying around at that point. But second of all, and this is maybe the more important thing, is that the most damaging of the cane borers don't enter the stems through the ends. They lay their eggs directly under the epidermis, usually on a, a terminal bud of the plant, and they get in that way. They're evolutionarily adapted to enter the plant 
without any pruning cuts, they're not waiting for that. So there are some opportunists, um, and these are a less damaging form of cane borer. Uh, cane borer is kind of a, a, a blanket. Generic. term. Yeah, it's a blanket term. There are some there are some small insects that get in there and they do a little bit of damage uh, by crawling in through the end stems because they're just opportunistically looking for a place to overwinter. Most of that actually does happen at the end of the season. But for the specialist cane borers that do so much damage, I guess my point about this is don't think that this is going to stop the cane borers from getting into your roses because it probably won't. Okay. I um, I never really worried about prune sealer. Um, and I use a Atari brush, you know, um, by Bonide. I've, I haven't tried Elmer's nail polish, other things that people are trying. I'm just kind of a one trick pony. I, I use what works. But... I never worried about cane borers, uh, probably uh, until the past two years. And I think that when I looked at what was happening to the roses over winter, and I saw that they were boring all the way down to the crane, uh, cane crown, and I was losing canes, I started taking a harder look. And so last year, I had just gone around after a, um, a bloom and I cut down some of the canes and I saw this white dust, which was pith, you know, of the cane on the leaves. And I, and as I was looking at it and saying, you've got to be kidding me. I just cut this. What is going on? Somebody had been drilling in. And so as I cut it and I'm standing there in disbelief, something was flying around me trying to get in my cane again. And so I think that that just convinced me. But to your point, Jason, I don't know what uh, borer, because there are several different kinds. When I looked in that cane, I did find bugs that had burrowed um, that were lifeless. They weren't moving. So I don't know what, there wasn't current activity going on. So I'm not sure, but I, I do know that something was thinking that it wanted to get into that fresh cut again. So from my practice, I do use prune sealer all the time just because it takes a second um, and I want to try to protect the cane, but I don't know. Hearing you say that you're not using it, um, I'm just wondering maybe if it's a Canada, U.S. thing. I don't know. Well, it certainly could be the, the case. And I would never argue with anybody in their own garden about what works. Sure. Yeah. So if somebody tells me, you know, I'm in... Ohio. And if I don't prune, <laughs> prune seal, I get this, this problem. I'm going to listen to them. I, I'm going to respect sure. that. But but ultimately, the specialty cane borers, the ones that do go down to the very base of the plant, I would almost wonder if there's kind of a, a, a coincidental thing happening here because okay. people see the hole in the top, which is usually from the opportunists. They also see the swelling of the cane going down and then uh, the damage at the base. And that could be from a completely separate insect. Um, okay. But we know we know that the 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 redneck cane borer, the raspberry cane borer, they don't wait for those cut ends. They don't get in through the cut ends. They lay their eggs directly into the plant. So uh, you won't be stopping them uh, by the pruning sealer, but you may stop some of the opportunists. So okay. whether that's worth your time, that's an open question. I, I don't find it because just like cutting at the 45 degree angle would take you extra time. Also, uh, sealing your pruning yeah. cuts takes extra time that I would rather be using on something else. And 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 I'm wasting 24 hours watering my my soaking my roses. I mean, I'm getting pearls here from you. I'm learning so many quick things that I might be able to remove from my routine. So I yeah. appreciate that. Carefully, and carefully and watching your own results, right? Which makes yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. So let's go on to the next topic here, which is should you plant your roses with the crown below the soil surface? And I hear varying things. I've Most of the recommendations say that it should go below the surface by two inches or five centimeters or four inches or six inches. Some say, or I say, uh, more or less level with the soil uh, level. The crown should be at the soil level. And then I've even seen some occasional suppliers saying you should plant it a little bit higher. Which, yeah. is, which is an unusual recommendation. So where do you sit on this? Well, um, when I first started gardening, um, I, I kept the crown above the soil. And I, like I said, I've got very heavy clay soil. Oftentimes it's very difficult to dig. And we've got uh, shells in the soil. And so I take it down as far as I can. But 
often my crown is just if this is the soil level i would say that the, here we are that the crown is just here like this and what i like about that is when i was doing that we didn't have own root we only had dr huey grafted roses available and i like being able to have that crown just above the soil in the event that it's going to push a sucker, well, I can easily see when it's coming below the crown. So I like that. Um, but now that I have a lot more, you know, own root and um, multiflora, fortuniana, different rootstocks available, I've been playing with it a little bit more. And I think that for my Dr. Huey, which does not do well here, um, I still like to have it just above ground so I can watch that graft. So I don't know for the people who are worried about multiflora in their environment, maybe that's something that they would want to consider because I think multiflora is so awesome, that rootstock here for us in 7B. Um, but for the roses that are down by the water that are getting, you know, 50 mile an hour winds, you know, the gale winds, the cold, I put those deeper, all of them. And why? Because I want to protect the crown and it just saves me from winter prep to make sure that I'm getting them uh, covered up well, but on the opposite side of the house where I'm not getting that kind of um, you know, environment, I oftentimes just keep them above the ground a little bit. So I'm curious what you're doing in yeah, Canada. I, there, there isn't a lot of difference and I wouldn't speak for Canada, I'm zone eight. So okay. um, compared to the rest of Canada, we're like, uh, we're okay. like Hawaii. It's, a, it's, it's okay. like a little tropical here comparison. <laughs> uh, so. I, I do more or less the same as you. I try to get my my crown more or less at the soil level because I like to go in there and I check on it and I because okay. it, it is the most vulnerable, most susceptible part of the plant. And I also go with my gut, which is that uh, for most plants, the crown uh, is at the soil level. That's the way they actually grow in nature. Is the crown lives at the soil level. Um, what's below it is the root and what's above it is the stem, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I I go with that and I then I say about this one, it's situational because I hear from so many gardeners who are in colder climates who yeah. say, no, 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 my crown has to be much, yeah. much lower. Otherwise I will lose all of my canes yeah. and I'm done for. So it has to be much lower. So I leave it to the experience of the individual gardener uh, in a milder climate like mine. I like to have it up a little bit higher so I can see yeah. it. And I do mulch over it in the summer, you know, uh, and, but in a, in a colder climate, I think it probably makes good sense to go a little bit lower. Yeah, no, I agree. And then on my Facebook page, if anybody has been there, that's one of the rules. One of the things we're not allowed to talk about because it gets so heated is how you're planting the depth of the crown because it just gets hot, <laughs> the conversations. Yeah, I, I wonder why, you know, sorry, on a side note, I wonder why people get so personal about this because it's your garden. It, exactly. Then, plant it the way you want to. I, I won't exactly. I won't criticize, you know. Um, and and I, again, I've, I've said the same thing about the, the pruning sealer. You know, hey, if you're if you're putting glue on, if you're putting uh, nail polish on, if you're putting tar on, it's it's your call how to how to take care of your plants. It's also your call how much time to put into that activity and your judgment call about whether it's worthwhile. Um, so I think um, people sharing this information, if you're in a cold climate uh, and you're losing roses because the yeah. crown is too high, you'll learn pretty quickly. And if yep. you're in my climate and you're getting away with it year after year, that works too. So let's move on to the next one here, which is Epsom salts. Epsom um, salt. Um, you should add a certain amount of Epsom salts to this, to each plant every year, and sometimes it varies between a quarter cup. You know, whatever it is, they say add it to each rose every year. What do you What do you think on that? Well, I was recently talking to um, a master gardener, and they were saying that they had great success using Epsom every year, and they do it. And from my perspective, I don't know if I should be hashtag lazy gardener, but I don't want to give my roses something that they don't need just by routine. It's um, um, IPM is integrated pest management. And so um, that's concerning pests, but I just want to have a very gentle approach to my roses. Do a, um, a soil test every year or every other year at a minimum to make sure that you really do need to be adding whatever you're adding, you know, the potassium, the calcium, the magnesium, you know, all of these things that you can add. And I think that you could do more harm by either adding it improperly at the wrong rate. Um, and if your rose doesn't need it. And so for my garden, I garden organically and I don't 
really do a lot. Um, I don't get, I don't put any amendments really into, I, I use compost and that's it, something that's very gentle and it'll give them a long feed. But other than compost, I'm not going to give them any other nutrients unless I see a deficiency. Perfect. Your yeah, thoughts? I think, I think with magnesium sulfate and Epsom salts, uh, the same thing. Um, if you're magnesium deficient, it will help you. And if you're not magnesium deficient, yeah. it is not a good thing. Um, yeah. Adding excess magnesium just by a routine can tend to lock out calcium. So people don't realize that some of the nutrients are actually competing in the soil for those uh, cation spaces in the soil. So uh, if you, uh, with tomatoes, for instance, if you routinely add magnesium, you may end up with blossom end rot because you've locked out the calcium. Um, so you've created the problem and then you try to solve it with eggshells. So uh, right. it's not, it's not a, not a, a fantastic thing. It's a good practice to only add what you kind of need. And you probably get better bang for your buck adding a general purpose fertilizer or something organic that sort of like uh, across the board has a lot of different nutrients than focusing so specifically on that one nutrient. Although I have to say, it, somebody who's in a, unknowingly in a soil that is deficient of magnesium and puts in Epsom salts and suddenly their plants are performing yeah. great, I can see why that ends up being that anecdotal evidence for why yeah. this is a good practice and why they swear by it and say, hey, everybody should do this, even though it was really a specific thing to their own soil. The only thing that I want to add is that, especially for new gardeners, or you're in a new home that you're not familiar with, you can either get a soil test online through Amazon or wherever, but your local agricultural center will do a soil test for you. And here where I'm located, it's only $10. And right. so then they'll come back with a computer report and they'll spell out for you what you're deficient in and the rate that you need to uh, provide it. And then they'll also give you advice which product you should go get that they recommend. And having that advice is so valuable because we have a lawn company that wants to come through and do our treatments. And they said, oh, we did a soil test for you and you need, you know, this product and this product, lots of money. And I pulled out my little test and I said, oh yeah, well, according to this, I don't need that. And it's just nice to know be the, uh, the head gardener in your property, what's really going on. So um, it's cheap, get it done every other year or so, and only add what there is as need. Perfect. So let's talk about compost tea, because I hear all sorts of wild claims about what compost tea can do. Uh, and really what we're talking about here is just you know, compost or even manure diluted greatly in water and then applied either to the foliage of the plant or directly to the base of the plant. And some of the claims I hear is that this can reduce uh, disease. It can, can fight black spot, fight powdery mildew, or reduce pests on your plants. Um, what, what do you think on that? Well, my thought is anytime anybody says that something is going to reduce black spot, I get excited. And I think, who? try it. Let me know. Does it work? And of course, you know, if they're having, you know, across the board, excellent results. I might try it. But for me, um, it sounds like a lot of work, Jason, <laughs> to do a compost tea. What I've looked at, is it like three days of soaking and doing who has time for this? <laughs> I don't know if it was something that was, um, you know, available already mixed up. I'm going to try it. Um, but I find that truly, if you want to reduce the black spot and the issues, you need to focus on the soil first. And so I would do that test, find out what's going on in the soil. Compost is awesome. So if I'm thinking about tea, just being a liquid composty thing that is going down and it's immediately available for uptake for the rose. Okay, if you like that, but from my perspective, I would rather just top dress with compost and let, okay, good, and let it take yeah. its time. It, and it, it, it makes its own tea. Yes, it yes, yes. With, with the rain it make, or, or irrigation water, it makes its own tea. And exactly. the, the studies about whether it does what people say it does are so inconsistent, are okay. so inconsistent yeah. that um, the the evidence is weak, I would just say. And and I've seen, uh, there's, a, there's a garden YouTuber named uh, Robert Pavlis who has literally written the book on garden myths 
who I've uh, collaborated with a little bit. And oh, okay. he's uh, he's fantastic. And he kind of debunks this one in depth. So I won't go into that again, uh, but I, I agree with you. Uh, okay, good. You know, you'd be better off just applying the compost or the manure, let nature make the tea out of it with yeah. irrigation or with rain. Um, next one here I wanted to talk about is, should you save your banana peels or your coffee grounds <laughs> and apply them directly to the base of your roses? And I'm gonna give you mine on this here to say, okay. if you want to, if you want to, I mean, it's just okay. like the compost tea thing. All of these things release organic matter and release nutrients for the plant. If you put them into your compost first and composted them together with a bunch of other things and then applied them to the rose afterwards, it's fine. And if you want to apply them right now, it's fine too. There's nothing particularly special about uh, banana peels or coffee grounds nutritionally that would make you think, oh, I really have to have this one separate from everything else. I agree with you. And I'm just kind of laughing, thinking about, do I even have time for that? You know, taking the banana peels, my dogs are going to love it. I've got enough problems right now with fish being dropped from the river in my garden. Now all I need is to put banana peels out there. Okay, I've got just a couple more for you here. Things that I've heard around that people kind of swear by. One yeah. of them is a product, and I, I don't want to slag on a product particularly, but I hear it so much that Super Thrive or B1 is okay. a vitamin mix that will either, when you soak it in your bare root roses, it'll help them to like get a great start. Or if you're transplanting a rose, you should use this. Have you heard this? Have you tried it? What's your thoughts on it? Well, I have it in my garage and I've never used it. And I, I think I bought it because I heard from people, oh, you've got to have it. It's amazing. And I was actually thinking about it for propagation initially. People were having success in using that. So this goes right along with, I don't want to add nutrients that are not needed. What is your thought? You know, I, again, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I don't add things both budget wise and for, you know, adding nutrients to the soil. I don't add things unless I have a really strong evidence that they're going to help the plant. And the problem with things that call themselves like soil conditioners or vitamin solutions or um, that don't make specific claims or don't offer specific evidence, I just, I start out default skeptical on them. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of like people could say, well, if you haven't tried it, how would you know it doesn't work? And yeah. I, you know, fair, fair enough point, but I like to put the onus back on the other person and say, okay, but if they're not offering any description of what it really does scientifically, and if they're not offering any independent evidence that it's doing that, why are you asking me to spend $29 on this on this thing? So I think that's where I sit on it. Um, I think the idea of soaking a plant in a B1 solution, and I'm talking about now where I've looked at it in the research, isn't really well supported. So uh, that's my default on it. Obviously, we're going to hear from other Rose people who say, no, I tried it. It worked really well. And I'm in no position to argue with anecdotal evidence, but I just was curious as to what you thought of it. Yeah, no, I have I have it, but I haven't had a need to want to even try it yet. So All right. And final topic here I just wanted to talk about is rose mosaic virus. And um okay. uh, you know, funny story on this one. The the idea that it can be spread by your pruning tools. I actually inadvertently had a hand in spreading this rumor. I think I made a video where I said, oh, while you're propagating or while you're pruning, you should clean, uh -huh. you, should clean your <laughs> tools and you can spread virus around and so on and so forth. And then people came back and said, actually, they've done the study that says that it is not spread around on the pruning tools. They tested it and found that that wasn't the case. So this is my, I'm okay. sorry, uh, you know, that I started spreading that rumor or at least had a hand in it. But I don't think that that's the only reason why you would clean your pruning tools. I think sure. there's all sorts of other diseases, including fungal and bacterial infections and other viruses that you certainly can spread with your tools. It just happens that rose mosaic virus is not one of them. Primarily, I hear that it's that it's spread through root grafting, that uh, yeah. in, in the production fields, that it's spread by uh, grafting and root grafting and that kind of thing, and not so much by pruning tools. Yeah, I became familiar with rose mosaic virus. Um, people need to make sure that they're not getting that confused. Sometimes they get it confused with RRD, rose rosette, which is a whole different craziness. But rose mosaic, I have in my garden and I was sent infected roots 
And in the U.S., um, I, I'm constantly hearing that it's a problem with Dr. Huey rootstock, that it's infected. And as the growers are grafting with Dr. Huey, you know, it gets to the next one and the next one. And it doesn't show up until it's in somebody's garden. And so um, your rose will decline. It's going to look beautiful for one or two years. And, um, and then it's just going to slowly decline. And I'm sure that some people are going to comment and say that theirs has had rose mosaic and there's no issues and... They just go from one rose to the next and clip. And um, so I just know for myself that it's going to look beautiful for a year or two and then slowly stop blooming and it's a mess. Um, and so it is a good idea to get them out of their garden um, just because it's not going to produce for you. But if you like having leaves that have a mottled yellow look to them and you think that they're pretty, it's not going to spread to anything. Um, but talking about tool cleanliness, I do clean in between each uh, rose because I just want to be extra careful. It takes a hot second and I want to make sure that I'm not spreading anything. And I know right offhand, maybe you can tell me if there's anything else that spreads, but gall, if your rose had crown gall and you don't know it, that is something that can be transferred. RRD cannot be transferred from um, tools, uh, but what else? Am I forgetting anything else that transfers? Well, yeah, gall, gall would be one of the big ones, but basically yeah. anything like that's a bacteria or a fungus, um, you're transferring inoculum from one plant to the next. And yeah, yeah. definitely definitely a good idea uh, yeah. to, to clean your tools either which way, but that's just one that you're not going to spread in that manner. Yeah. All right. That's all the topics I had for you. Um, and maybe I'll wrap up my video by just saying I've, I've agreed to talk through some other kinds of topics that uh, Kimberly has collected uh, from recommendations primarily from Rose suppliers, uh, I yes. think, where they've talked about how to plant things and what to do in the first year and so on. So that's the next part of this video. So go on straight over from this. If you found this an interesting question, go straight on over from this and, yes. uh, and check it out on the Rose Geek channel. Yep, Thanks we'll do part two. <laughs> part Thanks. two. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. You bet.